this. Welcome to this, uh, which is the fourth uh, in the series of SIAB seminars. My name is Paul Cowley. I'm a principal scientist at SIAB um, based in Makanda. Um, I see we've got 25 odd people that have joined in to listen to the seminar, which is great. Uh, just quickly want to brief you on uh, some house rules here. If you want to pose questions to our guest speaker today, just keep on doing them with the function at the bottom of your screen, the Q&A function. So you can post questions there. And then what we will do at the end of the presentation, I'll be going through the questions and Jessica can, can respond to, to the question. So yeah, enjoy. Um, thanks for joining us. And let me introduce our guest speaker today. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Jessica Glass, Dr. Jessica Glass. Um, Jessica recently finished her, her PhD uh, at Yale University. And despite being an American citizen, she's actually had a very long association with South Africa and a long association with SIAB. So she is uh, a proud member of the SIAB team. Um, and in fact, just recently finished a short postdoc at SIAB. The reason I say a short postdoc is because this uh, postdoc ended because she accepted a job uh, at the University of uh, Alaska at Fairbanks. Um, and despite her moving over to America again, I know that she will still be, be associated with SIAB. She's an honorary research associate and she plans to continue doing work uh, in South Africa and working at SIAB. Um, Jessica's talk today uh, is going to be fascinating. It deals mostly with the fish that you see on the screen behind me, the giant kingfish, which was the focus of her PhD study. So I think with having said that, I'm going to hand over to Jessica. Uh, thank you, Jessica. Over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Paul. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for attending. I'm just going to share my screen quickly. So you can see, there we go. Perfect. So thank you all so much again for listening and tuning in. I know it's load shedding here in South Africa for many of us. <laughs> um, and so I appreciate you all being here in spite of that. So today I'm gonna to talk about big data and specifically how we can use tiny molecules like DNA and isotopes to answer big questions in fisheries and evolutionary biology. And as Paul mentioned, uh, my career tra trajectory over the last several years has been shaped by my experiences here at SIAB and in South Africa and in the Southern Hemisphere uh, more generally. Um, from the time I was a master's student through my PhD to postdoc. Um, and as he mentioned, this kind of collaboration with SIAB is going to continue as I become an assistant professor, um, or actually I've already started. <laughs> um, and if some of you tuning in may not be as familiar with SIAB. Um, SIAB as an institution hosts a variety of research and platforms to support research, ranging from genomics to physiology to animal behavior in both marine and freshwater, uh, and as well as hosts the South African National Fish Collection. And so with that kind of broad framework in mind, um, the research here um, at SIAB has shaped kind of my perspective on, on fisheries and evolution. And a lot of my research aims to answer kind of one overarching question, which is how does evolution inform fisheries? And to get at that, I look at these different facets of evolution, ranging from genotype or the underlying DNA or genetic code behind the phenotype or physical observable traits in fishes, all the way to animal behavior and environment and the intersection of these, so, these four different kind of facets, so to speak. And over the course of the last kind of 15 to 20 years of my training as a biologist, we have entered this data revolution, right? Big data. <laughs> Everyone wants your data, whether it's Facebook or the coffee shop down the street. And a lot of this sort of big data revolution is, is due to changes in technology and our ability to store data and to analyze data. And this has really changed the field of evolutionary biology and ichthyology, and especially my um, specialty of genomics. We've really moved from genetics to genomics, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And it makes sense because 
biodiversity on this planet is huge. Um, we need, there's a lot of data to be collected and we need kind of new approaches to understand the history of life. So for example, there are over 35,000 species of fishes and counting and more being described every year. So these big new kind of tools that we now have at our fingertips allow us to um, analyze biodiversity in, in new and exciting ways. So within these kind of four facets of genotype, phenotype, behavior, and environment, um, my, my research includes a bunch of different types of data ranging from genomic data to animal behavioral data, uh, pulling from open source global data sets on oceanographic variables and, and species traits, and even citizen science and observational data from, from fishermen and fishing stakeholders. And with those data sets, I'm able to address several themes in evolutionary biology and fisheries, ranging from categorizing biodiversity, looking at species connectivity, species migration, and um, even more so adaptation to their environments and the potential to kind of respond to changes and stressors. And these themes and these data allow us to address these really tangible fisheries management questions, ranging from how many species there are and how those species are interbreeding, if there's different stocks or populations, um, that informs the, the design of marine protected areas and spatial patterns and how species are, are interbreeding and using different resources, how they're uh, adapted to their specific habitats and how they're responding to stressors, whether that's a heat wave or um, changes in ocean acidification or pollution and, and other kind of human inputs. I don't have time to talk about all of this today, so I'm just going to focus on kind of two case studies of how we've used or how my research has used these kind of tiny molecules uh, to answer some big questions and that's specifically uh, genomics and stable isotopes. So first focusing on the genomic component, um, here is a figure of genome sizes of different kind of groups of organisms across the, the tree of life. So on the y-axis here, you can see uh, we have flowering plants all the way down to jawless fishes. And then on the x-axis, a measure of the kind of ranges of genome sizes of these organisms. So for reference, the human um, draft genome is a, is a haploid genome that's 3,200 megabase pairs. And one megabase is 1 million bases. So this human draft genome is over 3 billion base pairs long. And it took 13 years to draft the human genome. And now you can sequence a non-model organism genome in just a matter of, of days. And so we've really come a long way. You can see here, I study um, mostly telas fishes and their genome sizes range from about 600 megabases to about 7,000. And then you have the lung fishes all the way over here with uh, genotypes is, that are over 70 billion base pairs long. And when I talk about base pairs, I'm talking about these nitrogenous bases that um, bond together in specific ways and together form this double helix structure of DNA. And so we can measure the length of a gene or a genome in terms of the number of base pairs. So moving on to the groups of fishes that uh, I've been looking at these base pairs with, I study the group of fishes called Carinchoidae. Um, it includes about 155 species. You might be familiar with a lot of these uh, ranging from the dolphin fishes, the mahi-mahi, to the remoras, and then the largest kind of clade within this, or group within this clade rather, uh, are the jacks and the kingfish and the trevallis. And the reason I study this group um, is because the vast majority of species are important for commercial subsistence or small scale fisheries. Um, some countries are even starting to farm carangids. And so studying this group allows me to think about fisheries management across all these different types of fishing sectors. This is a map of species richness of the carangoids that I generated using expert range maps from IUCN and Aquamaps. And you can see here that the bulk of diversity is in this coral triangle uh, region. Uh, and a lot of species are also found in the Western Indian Ocean. And so thinking about why there are so many species that are able to inhabit these regions at the same time leads us to questions like, are their ecologies different? And are their habitats different? You know, what determines um, how many species are able to survive in a given environment? And this is a really important question for fish biology that's needed to, to manage every species of fish 
um, given their present distributions and their present habitats, given the, their past evolutionary histories, and given what we know about how Earth is changing and how those habitats might be changing as well. And one of the most funda fundamental ways that we can start uh, asking questions like this is by understanding the evolutionary history of the group and looking at the phylogeny. Now, in the past, we've been really limited in, in estimating with a, with a lot of accuracy the kind of big picture phylogenies of these groups or the tree of life of these of fishes and other organisms, um, partially due to limitations in technology. And so shown here are three different kind of phylogenetic tree topologies that are contentious. And you can see here that the researchers have used various numbers of loci or gene regions ranging from 10 genes to a few dozen. Um, and the exciting thing about this big data revolution is that we're able to sequence a huge, much larger amount of data now for a much lower cost. And so what I did was actually target close to a thousand loci and say for the first time with, a, with high confidence what the evolutionary history of this group has been and how the species of carangoids are related to each other. And then integrating data that we have from fossils, we can actually estimate the age of this group and understand historically you know, why certain species evolved when they did and what has led to kind of large uh, or patterns of kind of higher rates of lineage diversification and how that relates to historic patterns of climate and oceanography. It's also allowed uh, me to identify some problems in the group and specifically the fact that the taxonomic um, or the taxonomy of this group doesn't actually reflect the evolutionary history. And um, that's a problem because it's, it's not everyone can go and take a sample of a fish and figure out what species it is using the DNA. We use field guides and those field guides are designed in theory to um, track the evolutionary history of the group and give accurate kind of characters so that when we're out in the field, whether you're a fisherman or a scientist, you can say with certainty that, you know, this species is, you know, in this genus. Um, thinking kind of more broadly, it's important to keep this phylogeny in the back of our heads when we're thinking about other big picture questions in fisheries and evolutionary biology. Um, and having this phylogeny gives us a strong foundation to then dig deeper into certain parts of the tree of life. Um, so for example, this is the giant kingfish. And once we figured out, you know, how these species were related to each other in the phylogeny, it led to more questions of like, for one species, how many populations are there? And then you can go back to the phylogeny and, and think about questions like, okay, if you have a certain populations, are they responding similarly to stressors? And then are closely related species to this kingfish also responding similarly or differently to stressors? And how does that relate to competition among species and how they're able to utilize their habitat, especially given that a lot of these species uh, you know, live in the same type of environments. We don't have enough time uh, with climate change and a lot of these other changes that are occurring in the ocean uh, to analyze every 35,000 species of fish. And so understanding species relationships in a phylogenetic context is really valuable um, for thinking about evolution and, and, and the conservation of, of fisheries in the long term. We care about that for many reasons. One, we have biodiversity metrics that we need to uh, maintain as, as nations. Um, secondly, we like to eat fish and we like to fish for fish. And a lot of the kingfish are these iconic sport fishes um, that you know, bring a lot of money into local economies for people going to fish for them from all over the world. Um, I'm going to focus today on two iconic sport fish, the bluefin kingfish and the giant kingfish. Their ranges are shown here. They're, they have Indo-Pacific ranges and they overlap throughout a lot of their range. So the giant kingfish range is in light red and the bluefin range is in light blue and then areas where they overlap are in purple here. And previously we didn't really, we didn't know how individuals across this range were interbreeding. The only genetic work done on these two species um, took place in Hawaii, which you can see is just a small proportion of their range. And given recent information on 
the, this, these two species movement behavior, it led to me thinking, okay, well, if we know that they are moving in certain ways based on tagging studies, how are, their, how are they interbreeding and how is their DNA being exchanged? So as I was starting to kind of integrate some new genomic methods, um, I fortunately teamed up with two scientists at Brigham Young University, Brandon Pickett and Keone Kawe. And Brandon, for his PhD research, was actually sequenced the whole genomes of these two species at very high coverage. Um, these were ranging from six to seven billion base pairs each. And so it, it allowed us to really take this further um, and, and get at the fine scale differences in these species um, DNA across their ranges. And Brandon has a great way of describing how you do whole genome assembly. You basically take the DNA, you break it apart, and then you try to put it back together again. Um, he, he says that it's, it's similar to scanning a photograph, but instead of a nice digital image, you're piecing together a, th a hundred puzzles with tens of thousands of pieces each. And you actually never get one single image. You kind of get an approximation to that image. And that is only achievable um, with complex algorithms and machine learning run on a super, supercomputer. So Brandon did a huge amount of work to assemble these genomes. And they're, I should say they're open source. They're available for anyone who also wants to come and, and use these genomes to ask other questions in biology. And so with, with those genomes, I was able to map other type of genomic data that we call SNPs, which are kind of individual mutation sites, to these genomes to get thousands and thousands of, of data points, essentially. So I sampled 13 sites across the Indo-Pacific uh, and several hundred individuals of giant trevallis and several dozen individuals of bluefin trevallis. And what we found, only possible with the fact that we had so many SNP loci was separate populations, uh, genetic populations of bluefin trevallis in Hawaii and a separate genetic population of giant trevallis, I call them trevallis or kingfish, I'm gonna use those terms interchangeably, uh, in, in Hawaii and in, in the island of Kiribati. We also found um, separate putative populations in um, this kind of Indo, uh, West Pacific Eastern Indian Ocean region, whereas in the Western Indian Ocean, these two species were essentially panmictic and there's a lot of genetic exchange going on. And I want to point out the importance of this kind of work for two reasons. One, in Hawaii, these fishes are very culturally important and significant to the livelihoods of Hawaiian natives. They've been, um, there's stories about these two fishes in their culture and their traditions, in their language, um, in their fishing techniques. And unfortunately, these two fishes have been overfished there. And in the case of the giant trevally or giant kingfish continue to be overfished. And so understanding that there is a unique genetic population there that the, that the larvae aren't being kind of distributed elsewhere is important for the conservation of this of this area and hopefully um, can lead to some kind of more attention on the fact that we should really figure out a lot more questions like where are they spawning for example um, on that note there's been a couple of areas where we know that there's large spawning aggregations of these two species one in southern mozambique one in no northern mozambique and a few other areas but a lot of that information still isn't known. And it's really fascinating to think about um, the kind of exchange between data types. Um, this is work that's done by Ryan Daly and others here in South Africa looking at those spawning aggregations. Um, and so just, they're just, Ryan has taken some really beautiful images of this aggregation. It's incredible. And what they found is sort of variance in residency patterns where some fish are more resident here at the aggregation site year round, whereas others are traveling several hundred kilometers kind of hugging the coastline into different estuaries and river systems. And the reason I have this in here now is because we've actually been able to integrate both genomic data and tagging data and isotope data, which I'll talk about in a second, and paint a really clear picture of the species biology by integrating these different data types. On the same note, um, citizen science data is also very important um, in the big data revolution. So uh, work that's been done by Paul and my master's student, Sheena Talma in the Seychelles has identified 
um, that trevallies and kingfish are really important for the stakeholders of the Seychelles, which is where Sheena is from and currently working. So this is um, a survey that she did in Farquhar Atoll where uh, sport fishermen or fly fishing uh, guides ranked their targeted fish species and all of them ranked trevallies as number one. And so this was important at the, at the time because no one had looked at trevally um, genetic patterns before and we were able to really engage with these stakeholders and figure out what they wanted to know and they were able to engage their clients and actually collecting the data and sharing the data and talking about the importance of these species, the importance of catch and release fishing um, and it just made the whole science of genetics and, and uh, other methods more powerful. And this really took off. And I just want to point out how important um, the collaboration with, with these stakeholders and these recreational fishermen have been. Um, and as they continue to grow, uh, we've been able to get samples from several locations that were otherwise not feasible for me to get to and collect um, data from. Some of the guys got really into it and posted on their Instagram. And so this is a really fulfilling part of this work. Um, also because a lot of these fishermen know the fish so well, they're spending months and they're so passionate about these species. And so there's a lot of kind of metadata or ecological knowledge that we can bring to this about their movement patterns and their behaviors and their diets that we couldn't under otherwise um, you know, get by just being out there for a few weeks at a time. So that being said, integrating all these data types allows us to get to like what we call, or I call this sort of sweet spot where you're able to kind of bridge these different fields or not fields or sub sort of facets of evolution to paint a clear picture of this species biology. Um, and so one kind of takeaway from the genetic work is that these kingfish have these really kind of, although they have these sort of subgroupings, there's there's still pretty characteristic of these large pelagic like fishes, even though they're not pelagic, they're, they're just large bodied. Um, and one of the questions that you might ask then are kind of what are these species eating? Are their diets similar to more pelagic species or are they more similar to kind of coral reef species? And one way we can get at that is looking at isotopes. So to look at a fish's diet, you can, you can measure its stomach contents. You can catch the fish and um, either make it digest its stomach or kill it and look at the stomach and look and see what it was eating um, at that point in time. But that really only gives you a snapshot of the diet. And it's not really a feasible approach for what the type of data I wanted where we were putting the fish back in the water really quickly or the, the fishing um, uh, charter operators needed to kind of quickly release those individuals. And so what you can do instead is look at um, the isotopes of nitrogen and carbon, stable isotopes. And this literally only involves taking a tiny amount of muscle tissue. Uh, and then you can answer these really big questions on trophic position. And trophic position essentially tells you kind of in a very simplified version, where in the food web um, an organism sits relative to other organisms. Um, and you can also estimate trophic niche width, which gives sort of the breadth of trophic variation without assigning it to kind of one of these traditional trophic bins. And um, the ratio of, of nitrogen 15 to nitrogen 14 allows you to estimate trophic position. And the ratio of carbon 13 to carbon 12 allows you to look at um, the, the source of carbon in that, in that organism's diet, whether it is offshore or freshwater or marine. And so in combination, using these tiny isotopes, we can answer some pretty big questions. Now, some species might, you know, often consume pelagic or kind of open ocean level fishes, whereas others might consume more benthic fishes. And that can be really kind of geographic and habitat dependent. And this spatial variation in trophic position is important, but it's also unknown for a lot of fish species because oftentimes people, scientists are just focusing on kind of one region. And so what we wanted to know was across um, several sites in the Western Indian Ocean, how is this trophic niche 
different amongst kingfish, specifically giant kingfish at these different sites. And so we sampled over the course of four years, uh, 42 adults and 12 juveniles from four different sampling sites three of which were in the Seychelles and included Mahe Island, which is a granitic island, St. Joseph and Providence atolls, which are coral atolls, and then the spawning aggregation at Plano de Oro, which is sort of a, a coastal kind of rocky reef habitat. Um, and I should point out for the isotope people here, if there are any, that often it's hard to do these comparative trophic studies because of variation in nitrogen cycling across this, what we call an isoscape. And so here specifically, I use a method called um, compound specific stable isotope analysis of amino acids. It's a mouthful, but essentially it allowed us uh, to look at nitrogen and not have to sample um, baseline organisms, which is which actually proves quite difficult um, in these uh, marine settings. So jumping into the results, here are, um, this, this figure shows trophic position on the y-axis <clears throat> and carbon signature on the x-axis, ranging from more of an offshore signature uh, to a coastal signature. And you can see here that there's differences between sites with, for example, Providence Atoll having, those fishes having more of a coastal signature. Um, and at Pano de Oro, the, the fish had more of an offshore carbon signature. And, you can also see these differences in niche breadth. So Mahe, for example, has the largest kind of niche space. And that's because Mahe was um, one of the only sites where we sampled a, a lot more juveniles. And we found that the juveniles, first of all, had lower trophic positions. And secondly, had more of this coastal carbon signature. So their diets were more reflective of, of um, species that were closer to the, the coast. Um, whereas the adults were feeding more offshore what we also found is that these fish are really important predators and their trophic positions are equivalent to those of many apex uh, sharks and tunas um, that are found uh, all over the world. And so it, it proves that these fish are really important uh, predators in this region and that has some implications I'll talk about in a second. They're also just really <laughs> trophically unique. Um, this is a, a video um, from BBC that was put out a few years ago of giant trevallies in Farquhar Atoll uh, leaping out of the water to catch these sooty terns. And unfortunately, I didn't get any isotope data from these, but I think it's a really cool example of anecdotal data um, on species behavior that show that these really are top predators. This is a very unusual behavior. And it's a video that is it's so cool, I have to show it in all of my talks. Um, a little bit more on the results here. So this uh, axis shows, uh, the y-axis here shows trophic position uh, and the x-axis is showing fork length. And I'm highlighting these two individuals here that were two of the largest individuals that we sampled uh, from St. Joseph Atoll, yet they had some of the lowest trophic positions. And I'm gonna bring in some more data from Ryan Daly's work um, where they actually, these two individuals happen to also be fitted with acoustic transmitters and tagged so we can track their movement. And Ryan found that these two individuals were frequently visiting this other island that was about 90 k's away called Marie Louise and it suggests that giant trevally individuals have developed these local feeding strategies to use resources at neighboring islands. And that's interesting in the context of the species ecology. It's been shown also in Hawaii. And it's just really cool to link these different types of data and understand kind of what's going on here. Um, and I want to point out that the acoustic tracking array platform that is managed by Paul Cowley and, and um, Terry Murray at SIAB, they've been posting a lot this week on, on Twitter and I think on Instagram about a lot of the giant Trevally movement behavior. So check out their posts. There's some really great images that Ryan took and um, they've been really highlighting some of the results that they've been finding about this species movement behavior um, over the last several years. And when you think about the importance of um, understanding the spatial components of, of these fish's diets, I think um, it's important to, to say again that these are top predators. They're consuming a lot of um, prey species in, in the Seychelles and elsewhere across their ranges. Um, and 
carangoids as in, in general uh, comprise over a quarter of artisanal fishery catches in Seychelles. And so this is just, you know, this study represents one species diet and behavior um, in one region and scaling that upwards is really important, especially because you know, one of the main ways that we that we manage our marine resources and our fisheries is through spatial patterns of conservation. So designating protected areas or certain regions where you can fish or not fish or um, fish in certain times of year. Um, and so when you can get down to the nitty gritty of how these, how one organism is exhibiting changes from juvenile to adult and using habitats in different ways and, and this individual specialization in habitat usage, those are all critical components um, to really developing more comprehensive management plans. And this is really relevant in Seychelles because this, as a nation, Seychelles is currently implementing this huge marine spatial planning process where they are allocating you know, resources to um, certain user groups and stakeholders in a spatial and temporal context. So I'm gonna just briefly switch gears um, and talk about a couple of future projects that are in the works. Um, we'll be <laughs> at, when we can get back into the field, hopefully soon. Uh, my Bernie meme is becoming even more relevant because it's getting quite cold here now in South Africa. Um, but I think that the main thing I want, the main takeaway of these future projects is, is that with these genomes, and I'm gonna focus on the genomic work, but with these two genomes of, and, and we're, sequencing more genomes as well. Um, it really allows us to then move a whole step further and answer much more in-depth questions about species biology. So for example, um, the genomics of migration and the genetic underpinnings of why some species migrate and why they don't and how far they migrate and or not. Um, and Paul has observed um, in one estuary in the Northern Trans Sky called him Tentu, uh, which some of you may be familiar with because of the giant kingfish and these um, patterns that they exhibit there, behavioral patterns where they're doing this sort of interesting circling, circling behavior, uh, circling behavior uh, that has been highlighted by, um, I think David Attenborough a few years ago. Um, in this estuary, Paul's observed some differences in movement behavior um, between juveniles and subadults and based on fish sizes. And so one way that we can start looking at these differences, these size-based differences, is by looking at the transcriptome or the whole collection of RNA or expressed genes in a cell. And what you can do is actually non-lethally take different types of tissue samples and screen for specific genes to look at kind of what's causing those genes to be, um, and for lack of a better word, turned off or turned on, um, instigating migration or not. And we already know that there's some important candidate genes to screen for based on what we know about migration in other fishes and in other organisms, even from birds to butterflies. Um, a lot of these genes are conserved across several species. So some of those include the clock family, which is important for regulating circadian rhythm. Um, for example, in Chinook salmon in Alaska, they've found um, geographic differences in the expression of some of these clock family genes between different um, populations of Chinook salmon. And then the GREB1 um, gene is important for inducing transcription to enhance estrogen, which we know is important for maturation and egg production. And we can screen for other genes that we know are important for thermal regulation, um, osmoregulation, and um, circadian rhythm as well. On that note, um, a lot of these same types of responses are also similar responses to stressors. So for example, an increase in temperature in the water. And it's important to point out that in the Intentu, um, they're currently building uh, a, a very large bridge over this river upstream from the estuary. And so there's some new stressors that are being input into this environment, at least in the short term. And so it's another kind of facet that we can look at with the transcriptome analysis to see how, if these species are responding differently to these stressors and also integrating um, isotope data as well. And it's important um, in the intent to specifically because this 
estuary is still pretty pristine. Um, this map here shows different estuary syst and river systems in KZN and in the Transkei uh, that are either pretty highly degraded, shown in red, or still relatively undisturbed, shown in the dark blue here. And another um, interesting way that you can incorporate genomics and big data into looking at um, communities and, and anthropogenic stressors has to do with environmental DNA or eDNA, which essentially allows you to take a water sample and look at the DNA of everything that's, for the most part, been in that water um, in a relatively recent time period, and then do this sort of rapid community assessment. And eDNA has been around for a long time in the microbial community. The fish world is now getting around to it. Um, and it's a really powerful way to rapidly measure community composition and compare that to, for example, what we know from collections in these regions and what species have been there in the past. And so in the future, um, I think that a lot of these, the, the, the advances in, in data analyzation and collection allow us to get more and more into this sort of center ideal sweet spot of evolutionary biology that integrates these different types of, um, of data and paints, like I said, a bigger picture of a species biology. And that ranges from things like epigenetics or this sort of um, integration between genotype and phenotype and gene expression and even protein expression, uh, how those are kind of triggered by environmental or behavioral cues and getting to questions like species evolutionary uh, resilience and potential, how species, the evolutionary history of disease resistance and how species are expected to respond to stressors. Um, and again, putting that in a phylogenetic context so that you can compare species that are closely related to see if there's been similar kind of evolution to, st to stress response over time and how you might project a certain, a whole group of organism to respond to stressors in the future. But that being said, um, I wanna point out that with big data comes big responsibility. Um, you may have heard in the business world, I see these terms being thrown around called the six Bs of big data, volume, variety, velocity, veracity, value, and variability. And I think there's a lot of parallels to the scientific and conservation um, community relating to the quantity of data available, um, how much data is there to analyze and collect, the variety of data, whether you're, you're sequencing a genome or you're using kind of other types of metadata, including traditional ecological knowledge to, like I said, paint a bigger picture of that organism or that study system. Uh, velocity relates to the speed at which data are generated, but also the rate at which we can analyze data. And that's a huge limitation still of these big genomic data sets is com uh, computing power and the feasibility of analyzing them. Of course, data quality is always relevant, whether you're using big data or small data. And there's a practicality component. So the conservation value, whether it makes more sense to collect more data or use the best data that you have at the time to make decisions. And of course, um, utility in those data sets. So how much are they being shared across the globe? Is that sharing equitable? All of these um, factors come into play when you're considering you know, the data that you need, um, the data that's feasible to collect and the kind of cost benefit of, of jumping into this big data bandwagon. Um, bigger isn't always better. <laughs> this, these methods, while you get more bang for your buck, they still, especially in genomics, can still be very expensive. Um, and it, it, once you get the data, you have to store it, you need to manage databases, you need a lot of computing power, and you need a lot of bioinformatics training. So this week, actually, I'm attending a big data workshop. And um, one of the instructors just said that they downloaded a, a PEC bio kind of whole genome read of their organism. It was 400 million reads and 300 gigabytes of data, just one file. It's a huge amount of data to analyze. And I think it's exciting though, if you think about the roles of museums and collections in the past and their roles in the future, because we're at a, we're at a point where museums and collections like SIAB have to preserve these old types of data because we're still figuring out new ways to analyze 
you know, traditional types of data, whether that's preserved specimens or, or tissue samples, but also preserving these new types of data, which are mostly digital um, and need to be shared across the globe and distributed, like I said, fairly and practically. Um, I know SIAD is part of big initiatives like um, the Barcode of Life project. There's a big Smithsonian Global Genome Initiative. And I think it's, it's exciting to see how museums are playing an even more important role than, than ever and kind of contrary to some ideas that, you know, they're just these old specimens sitting there gathering dust. It's, it's absolutely critical that museums stay involved in, um, you know, this big data transformation. So with that being said, um, I have a lot of <laughs> co-authors and colleagues to thank, uh, as well as funding sources and um, institutions that have supported this, this research for several years, as well as um, a lot of citizen scientists and anglers and sport fishers that have enabled um, myself and my colleagues to collect all of this data. Um, and I want to, there's too many people to name individually, but there's been a lot of folks that have helped us over the years. And like I said, this um, collaboration with anglers and sport fishermen has, has continued to grow and um, is a really critical component of this work. I want to say thank you to SIAB, um, the SIAB staff and scientists um, that have shaped my career trajectory over the last nine years that I've been at SIAB um, and we've had a lot of fun. It's such a great institution and I'm so lucky to have been able to spend so much time here and looking forward to all of the kind of projects and collaborations that are still to come. And so on that note, I wanna thank all of you for listening. Um, please get in touch with me if you have additional questions after this webinar. I'm always open to new collaborations in South Africa and beyond. Um, we just found out last night, for example, we were just funded um, for a big grant to look at Arctic eDNA community composition and look at the phenology of, of new species that are coming into the Arctic environment that didn't used to be found there and using this very fine scale approach to look at timing of species um, during the summer as they're kind of entering new areas in the Arctic. Um, so a lot of exciting work still to come. And um, yeah, feel free to reach out with any questions. And I think Paul's going to moderate um, the chat now. I think you can type your questions in the Q&A. But if you have a pressing question that you want to ask um, over, over the Zoom, I think you can also do that too. So I'm going to stop sharing here and take it back to Paul. Science, uh, yeah, I think I've got a little bit of an internet issue. Perfect. Can anybody just indicate now. whether you can hear me? Yeah, you can yeah. hear me. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go over to the, the Q and A's. We have one question here so far. It's from Josie South, uh, also an Oregon Research Associate at SIA, based uh, in the UK. Hi, Josie. Thanks for the question. Uh, the question to Jessica is, I just really cool, the large individual that moved to Marie Louis uh, with the lower trophic positions, is this showing that they expand their spatial niche rather than their trophic niche within the usual foraging range to avoid uh, inter or interspecific competition or is there something else going on? Uh, thanks, Josie. Hi, that's a really good question. Um, well, Right, I, I, I think a lot, <laughs> I hate to say it, I hate to give you this answer, but I think more data would need to be collected to actually look at competition in that area. I don't know if I said this, but we have no idea like what the abundance of these giant kingfish are in the Seychelles. And so I think answering questions like that to see what their kind of capacity is in that area would allow us to answer your question better. Um, Certainly, I don't think it's an expansion of their niche necessarily, but kind of showing that individuals are able to specialize and utilize different habitats could suggest that they are avoiding, you know, competition at that at that at St. Joseph, the main atoll there.
Oh, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> we need more data. <laughs> yeah, great. Classic response. <laughs> great. Let's have a look. I think there's another question that's come up. Oh, just Jessica. But, I, I, there is someone who raised their hand. So if you want to unmute um, and ask that, you feel free. No Good questions morning. There's one. Good morning, Jessica. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. Good morning. Um, thanks for the talk. It was really amazing. And I enjoy the work that you've done thus far. I'm looking forward to what you guys are doing in the future. Um, my question is, with regards to the DNA sequencing of the fish and um, your loci that you looked at and all the SNPs, how did you sample the fish? Was it destructive or non-destructive? And then, um, yeah, go ahead. I'll ask the second question after. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I should have put a slide in about that. It was um, what we would call non-destructive. And so the cool, the I meant to say this, the amazing thing about this type of sequencing, not the whole genome sequencing, but the SNP collection is that we you can actually get all of those thousands of SNPs from one tiny clip of the fin. And so we would have, we would take a fin clip, store it in ethanol, and then sequence the uh, extract DNA from that clip of the fin and the fish would be released back into the water. Okay, that's amazing. Um, secondly, with regards to sequencing, was the sequencing carried out here in South Africa or did you do it overseas? Um, I did that sequencing overseas. Um, because uh, I was enrolled at, at university in the in America, um, but I'll, I'll point out that Syab has a MySeq, which is a really powerful sequencing machine as part of the um, genomics platform here, and so they do. Syab offers um, genomic sequencing on the MySeq here in South Africa. Okay, perfect. And then last question I have is with regards to the fishes themselves. Uh, did you find any? This might be a weird one, and you might not be able to answer it. Did you find any symbiotic relationships on the um, on the fish with um, smaller organisms like zooplankton or phytoplankton? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I did not. I know we found there were a couple instances where we found some parasites on the brain um, that looked like little isopods, and I think I did keep some of them, but I wasn't looking. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't looking at the for those. But that's a you know that's a great question especially yeah. when you look at whole genome sequencing and how you can, this horizontal dream transfer between sure. um, yes. symbiotic organisms. Okay, perfect, thank you. That's all for me. Great, thank you. Thanks, Patan. Um, any more questions? Please just introduce yourselves too uh, when you do ask a question, thank you. I see one question here from Pule. Um, the, can I please repeat the isotope method I used? So I used um, a method called compound specific stable isotope analysis of amino acids. And you're basically looking at those nitrogen isotopes in specific amino acids because in some amino acids, um, the nitrogen doesn't fractionate up the trophic level like in others. And so that allows you to to get at the baseline nitrogen value of that, where that sample was taken in that space and, and time. Um, and I can always email that to you, Pule, if you want um, some more information about it. Um, I see a question here in the chat from Penny. How would you advise um, a young postgrad setting out who wants to get into genomics to plan the trajectory of their journey? That's a really good question. Um, I think that, it takes a lot of reading <laughs> and I'm still learning, it's moving so quickly. I'm also still learning about new methods every single day. Um, and I think having a good kind of group of, of other scientists to support you also can help you plan out what you wanna do. Having an advisor who um, is interested in, in enabling those methods and working a lot, you know, we have that here at SIA with people doing all sorts of genetics projects at the, um, in the lab at the same time. Um, it's important to think about, like I said, the question and the feasibility of those data sets, um, whether you need to even take a next gen approach, meaning sequence whole, you know, genomic information versus just sequencing 
like the um, barcode gene, for example. And there's some interesting work that's been done here in South Africa by other researchers about weighing the cost and benefits of using kind of whole genome versus more traditional approaches to DNA analysis. Um, I hope that answers your question, Penny. Um, Brishan, do you want to also ask another one? Hi, sorry. Um, so yeah, Excellent. just to introduce myself, Brishan from, I'm an MSc student at the University of Advantage. And um, yeah, so my question is with regards to all your sampling sites, how were you able to obtain jurisdiction or ethics if needed to sample such a vast area? Right, yeah, that's a great question and really important. And we worked with fishing uh, management agencies at all of those locations. So working with the like local department of fisheries and Seychelles, that's the Seychelles Fishing Authority and getting permits in place so that we can then go and collect those specimens um, and catalog them in our museum here at Syab and in the museum at Yale so that those tissue samples and DNA samples are are cataloged and preserved and available for other people to also come and, and use and, um, and subsample. Okay, that's perfect. And then lastly, uh, did you upload all the, the genetic data to, to NCBI or the Barcode of Life data systems? Which one did you use? Yep, so all of our um, whole genome sequences, uh, this the assemblies as well as the RAD data are available on NCBI. Um, and there's links to those. Um, if you email me, I can give you a link to our publication. Those are all on the SRA, the Sequence Read Archive. And so anyone can go and download the, any of the DDRAD data or the whole genome data um, from both of those species. Um, could I ask, I how come you did not use bold? I don't know if you know about it or, or not. The barcode of so, life data systems. Oh, um, for you mean for arc for archiving our data? Yes. Why did why did you choose NCBI over bold? I think that um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think barcode of life is only for the CO one barcoding gene. Um, NCBI is is it's free. It's searchable. When when I'm looking for genomic resources, I yeah. um, look on NCBI. I think the main reason I chose it is because it's free, <laughs> um, and okay. because it's a useful kind of internationally recognized. Not like barcode life isn't, but um, it's a it's a it can be more complicated, but it's a it's a very feasible way to kind of link your data sets with a lot of quality control to a publication. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah, thank you. Right, thank you very much. Uh, oh, do there's we have one, any other sorry, questions? One more, hand up. Yeah, one more person raise their hand. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello thank yes. you for your. Yeah, thank you for your fantastic talk. I'm attending a um, uh, uh, seminar from Finland, and I'm wow. uh, yes on the other side of the globe. <laughs> um, so I'm uh, not a uh, fish ecologist. I'm a modeler, and I'm interested in how uh, modeling how like um, spatial structure of marine reserves may affect the evolutionary potential or like genetic variation within fish populations. But uh, sorry if my questions are like ignorant, but I'm wondering if you observed any like local adaptation um, in these fishes. Like, for example, you mentioned that they have maybe different levels of disease resistance and like stress responses. Do you see these kind of local adaptation, um, locally adapted traits in these fishes? Uh, in your map, I think you identified like three big areas on the in the ocean but the, within each of these areas do you see local adaptation within each yeah that, that is a great question um and that's actually one that i am wanting to answer um, there's a real limitation mm -hmm. that i didn't talk about with the snp data set where there you know this the the way that we sequence you probably know the way that we sequence snps is, is basically these tiny fractions from all over the or, 
tiny pieces of the genome from all over the genome. And we really need to go to the whole genome resequencing route to get at these questions of local adaptation that's in the works in the future. Um, mm -hmm. If unless you have like a, a big structural variant or an inversion um, and you happen to, you know, sequence some SNP loci that are close to that, um, you know, part of the genome that's like really under selection, it's really mm -hmm. hard to, to get at those questions of adaptation mm -hmm. with just the SNP data sets alone. But that's a really, it's a really great question. And, and I honestly, that is where the field is heading as mm -hmm. whole genome resequencing gets cheaper and cheaper. More people mm -hmm. now are just, instead of just taking SNPs, they're sequencing the whole genome so that then you have a lot more mm -hmm. information and you can look at questions like localized adaptation. So mm -hmm. in Hawaii, for example, is, you know, you can look at areas like comparing Hawaii where there aren't a lot of like river systems to a region like South Africa where there's a lot of freshwater input. Um, and we know mm -hmm. that these, these kingfish spend a lot of time in freshwater and you can see if they're mm -hmm. locally adapted in, in ways that the Hawaiian fish aren't, for example. Mm -hmm. Did that answer thank your you. question? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, there's a lot of, um, a lot of amazing work that is relating to kind of these ocean, new oceanographic data and these coupled kind of biophysical models where you can model larval dispersal um, using genomic data and match that with oceanographic data. And it's work that I'm, I'm wanting to get into in Alaska um, very soon. Yeah, thank you very much. So I'm wondering, can I ask you one more question? So it's related, but do, are you aware of this theory called the geographic mosaic or coevolution? Like where those, different populations are adapted to their own environment so that the genetic variation is maintained by this geographic structure and gene flow between. And do you see that kind of things also going on in marine populations? Because most of the studies are in the like, terrestrial. Right, but, uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there, uh, yeah, I, I, I am familiar with that. I think there's a lot of work being done. I know there's a lot of being, work being done in like sam salmonids and, um, trout mm -hmm. populations as well as sticklebacks okay. and how those have adapted to their environments. Um, I okay. know that's obviously bridging marine and freshwater, um, but I think as, uh, I don't know examples on the top of my head are out there, but it, there's a lot of people that are doing similar kind of work, um, okay. I know here in South Africa. Do you think that kind of uh, idea that theory suggests could be like applied to um, marine protected area design, like how spatially uh, they should Absolutely. be located? Okay. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, 100%. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, here is a question on the Q&A there. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, you, you mentioned the need for museums to be on board with storing and preserving big data. How are museums responding to this need and how will they get the resources to respond? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, I think museums are responding very quickly and very well to this. Um, I know that uh, there's a, museums are facing a shortage of funding um, in America. I know that the funding is tight here in South Africa as well. And um, for example, I'm going to give an example of eDNA, where you're rather than collecting DNA from a single organism, you're collecting DNA from a site. And so it creates this sort of extra complication of how a museum makes that metadata, the information associated with that more accessible. And I know that the Smithsonian is currently working on a standard for other museums to follow to to preserve and store eDNA samples, whether you're just storing, you're storing the, the DNA extracts or the actual filters that you use that you run the water over and that you can then preserve. Um, and there isn't really a precedence for that yet. So the Smithsonian is jumping on this and museums are responding very quickly to those different kind of data needs. Um, and, and, and they're still very, very relevant. Managing these big data spaces um, is extremely important and time consuming and resource intensive. and um, I think that funding agencies are, are, are starting to recognize that as well. Um, and it's important for, I think we, I'm preaching to the choir here, but it's important for these facilities to show that they're integrating these different types of data. Um, 
And I think Syab does a great job of that through highlighting, you know, how its collections and how these different platforms are working together to answer these kind of pressing questions, um, particularly when it comes to kind of fisheries and fisheries livelihoods. Okay, one more quick question, I think, before we run out of time. Um, question. Okay, hello. Um, po possibility to securing, here's a graduate student in fisheries from Nigeria and interested in the use of eDNA, um, possibilities of securing supervision for graduate studies as an international student. Um, I think generally speaking, there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of it's worth reaching out to different professors whose research interests you and then trying to find funding whether your government offers funding or there are there's a lot of kind of european african funding opportunities to support um student postgraduate students throughout africa to study in in europe or um in america and it's worth exploring those opportunities and and always reaching out to someone whose work interests you and talk to them about your interests and then work with them to write a grant proposal or try to procure some other funding for advancing your studies okay i don't think we have any more questions i just want to thank everybody for joining us i see we had close on 50 participants and really from where the questions came from, it wasn't only from all over South Africa, it was all over Africa and all over the world. Uh, so thank you very much for listening and a big thanks. And I'm sure everybody could give a little tap and applaud to Jessica for a brilliant uh, presentation. Thanks, Jessica. And of course, best of luck um, when you eventually make it over to Alaska. And we look forward to seeing you back in South Africa soon again. Thank you very much, Great. everybody. Thank you, everyone.